This podcast is sponsored by Untapped. Untapped is about working with organisations to develop a sustainable, neurodiverse employment ecosystem. How fantastic is that? This includes the Neurodiversity Hub to assist students become more work ready and increase their chances of securing a job. Dyscalculia. It's a hard word to say and also a hard topic to talk about because it's not something that's really discussed in Australia. Yet it has lifelong impacts on individuals. We now live in an era where we must have functional financial literacy skills to manage day-to-day activities. From reading and signing up to contracts such as a mobile phone, to taking on financial debt such as credit cards or mortgages, or even how to manage a personal budget. All these activities can be affected by dyscalculia. If you don't have functional financial literacy skills, then you may not be able to understand what you're getting yourself into, leading to poor credit ratings or even unpaid fines. And I could talk to you all day about unpaid fines. Today's guest speaker is Brian Butterworth, a leader in the field of dyscalculia. I'm very excited to have Brian Butterworth on the show this evening, my this evening um, morning in the UK. Thank you for coming on the show, Brian. You're welcome. Uh, You have been working in the area of dyscalculia, which I've been practicing for a number of years now. How did you become involved in working in this space? Well, there are two answers to this. There's an extremely long answer and there's a short answer. The short answer is that I was working um, as a neuropsychologist, seeing patients with uh, particular disabilities, in particular language disabilities. We started seeing patients who had specific mathematics uh, disabilities. So um, before they, for example, had their stroke, they would be perfectly fine with maths and then they had a stroke which affected a particular part of their brain and then they became dyscalculic. And uh, so we saw quite a lot of these patients. And one of the, we discovered two things. Uh, one is we discovered a particular bit of the brain called the parietal lobe, which is just above your ear, particularly usually your left ear, and uh, that damage to this would mean that you're going to have trouble with numbers. If your parietal lobe was intact, but other parts of your brain were affected, for example, by a degenerative disease, you could still calculate, but maybe your language was very affected or your memory. So we we identified the parietal lobe, particularly the left parietal lobe, as being the critical area. We also discovered that the, the brain works in a modular way, at least for adults. That is, you could have these selective deficits um, for maths with everything else okay. And within the maths, you could have particular disabilities. For example, you might not be able to multiply anymore, or maybe your multiplication was retained, but you couldn't add anymore. Or maybe you could read numbers fine, or maybe just reading numbers was affected. Um, So we found that there was this modular structure to the adult mathematical brain. So then I started to think, why is it the parietal lobe that's important? And one of my early thoughts was that this bit of the parietal lobe, known as the intraparietal sulcus, is very close to an area that's responsible for your finger. And um, so I thought, well, maybe there's a connection between fingers and numbers. I mean, traditionally there is. You often have, like, the word digit means finger, and it also means number. And I thought, uh, maybe that's one of the reasons for this. And in fact, there are are, um, quite a lot of examples of people who've had parietal lobe damage, which affect both their calculation ability and their um, and their finger abilities. So we thought, well, okay, um, that's quite quite interesting. But how does this part of the brain come to be like that? So you have to look at these things in a developmental way. And I thought, well, you know, let's have start looking at the way in which this part of the brain develops and see how it becomes specialised. For numbers and then of course I started to think well what about if it doesn't develop in a typical way and you end up not being very good at numbers does it mimic 
the adult modular structure or is it something different? Well, it takes me back to being the speechy working with stroke patients ah. <laughs> in rehab, which was a long, long time ago now. And um, looking at the different parts of the language brain, we didn't really mm. look so much at the um, parts of the brain where your maths might be affected. I'm getting flashbacks now, <laughs> working mm. back in a long time ago. And so how did you get involved then? Because I, originally I was thought when I was researching you that you would have been a teacher. So learning that your background was in neuropsychology, uh, that was really fascinating to me and reading all the work you're doing. So then when did you start to work um, looking at the developmental phase and how that might connect with dyslexia and how dyscalculia could be a co-occurring difficulty um, that you're born with rather than acquiring through um, something like a stroke? An Austrian dyslexia expert uh, came to work with me for a year and she had noticed that quite a lot of her dyslexic children also had problems in number, but she didn't know an awful lot about this. This was uh, now a very distinguished uh, Austrian scientist uh, called Karin Landau. And so we decided to start a project looking specifically at developmental dyscalculia as opposed to the acquired type that I'd been working on before. And so we set up a study and we, uh, we tested uh, quite a lot of kids, some of whom were dyslexic, some of whom were dyscalculic according to our understanding then, which meant essentially just really, really, really bad at uh, maths uh, for, these were nine-year-olds, for nine-year-olds. So they were in the, like the bottom one or two percent on the standardized test. And also their, their teachers thought they weren't very good either. And we also looked at, at patients, who, uh, not patients, uh, children who had both dyslexia and dyscalculia. And one of the things that we discovered was that the kids who had dyscalculia were very bad at one very simple task, which was saying how many dots there were in a display. They just were not good at that. Um, this was true for them. It wasn't true for dyslexics. Uh, it was true for those who had dyslexia and dyscalculia. So we thought that one of the distinguishing features of dyscalculia, developmental dyscalculia, was not being very good on this very basic number sense, being able to see how many dots there were in a display. And so that's, that's really how we, we got started. We, we published a paper in 2004. And we also um, developed a, uh, a test based on this research, um, which became the dyscalculia screener. So it's a way in which um, a non-expert can, can test whether a, a child who's bad at maths also has this problem with estimating the number of dots in a display. So it's quite a good way, simple way, of distinguishing dyscalculics from kids who are just bad at maths for other reasons. So you can be purely dyscalculic rather than it being a co-occurring issue or deficit because you're dyslexic. Because a lot of times I talk about it being, if you're dyslexic, then you're either like myself have dysgraphia or you've got dyscalculia or you might have all four dyses, including dyspraxia. But it's normally the dyslexia that is the, the leading feature, if you, if you might say. Well, what, what happens is that kids go to be tested for their reading because everybody knows about that now. Um, and it turns out they're also bad at maths. And so people, including professionals, think it's their, the problem with reading, their dyslexia, that's the cause of their dyscalculia. Uh, what uh, Karen uh, and I found was that the, the kids who had the double deficit uh, dyscalculia and dyslexia were no worse on uh, our maths tasks than were the, the ones with the single de deficit, namely dyscalculia. And the dyslexics were perfectly okay on our maths tasks. So we don't think that dyslexia is the cause of dyscalculia. Of course, dyslexia can affect all aspects of education. So if you're learning maths mostly from books and you're not very good at reading, then of course it's going to have an effect on your maths. But that doesn't make you dyscalculic, it just makes you bad at maths. 
Yeah, because I was sure because my maths is terrible. And I remember having help when I was in secondary school and I remember the teacher in maths class sitting with me all the time. But when I was assessed, I, I did not have it, which I was really surprised about. So that would make sense why I'm bad at maths, but that I don't have a maths <laughs> disability or disorder. <laughs> Well, there's a bit of a dispute at the moment, uh, which is whether there is some statistically significant co-occurrence of dyslexia and dyscalculia. Uh, Karen's work, which is more extensive than mine in this area, and our work, suggests that there is a significant co-occurrence. So there must be some common cause. However, there's a very, very large uh, prevalent study in Cuba with using different statistical methods, which suggests that actually having uh, both conditions is just bad luck and it's not, there isn't a common cause. So I think this is, this is at the moment a, a matter of dispute. But even if there is a common cause, we've no idea what it is. So it doesn't look to be genetic because the, insofar as we understand the genetics, which is not very not great either for dyslexia or dyscalculia, particularly not for dyscalculia, that don't seem to be um, the same genes involved. It's a different part of the brain. Most people who are dyslexic are not dyscalculic, and most people who are dyscalculic are not dyslexic. Um, so it, it's still up for debate, I'd say. Yeah, there's a lot of debate around all four disses, as we call them. I don't think so much. Yeah. There doesn't seem to be such a debate around dyspraxia, but definitely still around dyslexia. That's why I was really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you about dyscalculia because the profile is is so small at the moment. I mean, even in Australia, dyslexia is still, you know, starting to just have a movement now where no one talks about dysgraphia or dyscalculia. So it's fantastic to be able to talk to you about what you've learned. Yeah. So it's not widely recognised. Not There's no official recognition for dyscalculia in Britain, um, in spite of the fact that I got my Member of Parliament to ask two parliamentary questions about it. Um, however, um, I have been asked by the Cabinet Office to prepare a paper on dyscalculia, so who knows, maybe something will happen. But we are typical of most countries, don't recognise dyscalculia, but it is recognised in the United States in the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, 2004. It's also recognised in Italy. They have a law, 170, which recognises dyscalculia. And the effect of both of these laws is to increase the number of kids who are assessed for dyscalculia and who are treated for it. So having some legal recognition is important. And I'm sorry it's not yet officially recognised in Australia. No, That's, so... I suspect, more job than mine. <laughs> <laughs> so there's, there's two questions. One is around assessment, so I don't forget. And the second one is, so it doesn't fall under specific... Because in the UK, you use the term specific learning difficulties. Is that right? Mm, yeah. so it, it, does it, it doesn't fall under that banner as a learning disability or specific learning difference? It depends who you're talking to. It, it's not clear. Certainly, if you look at what's currently published by the Department for Education, no, except that if you have dyscalculia, it prevents you from being a heavy goods vehicle driver. You tell me why that should be the case. I've no idea. But uh, that's basically the only thing it says um, on government website. But if, if you talk to educational psychologists, at least those who've been trained in dyscalculia, of course it is recognised as a specific learning uh, difficulty. So, you know, it's not governmental, but it is sort of in the system somewhere some of the time for some people. Wow, that's really interesting. I just assumed that in the UK, dyslexia, dyscalculia, dysgraphia and dyspraxia would all come under that banner of specific learning difficulties, which we're trying to bring into Australia and we've done a bit of work with our state government and they've actually named the four disses in their policy that they're oh. looking at developing 
because we've been pushing for the fact that there's these four areas that haven't really been covered or supported for students. But uh, I would have thought that it was like that in the UK. If you can get someone to do an assessment and say you're dyscalculic, you can have an argument with your local education authority or your school to get help. Uh, whether you'll succeed in that will depend to some extent about whether the local education authority or the school recognises as a specific learning difficulty. The fact that you've got an, you know, if you like, official certification that you've got this problem will help you. But it's certainly not automatic at the moment. And so who in the UK would uh, diagnose? So in Australia, it's normally ed psychs or neuropsychologists or developmental psychs that assess and speak to you. So what is, is it the same for dyscalculia? Uh, yes. Um, the problem is that most, dis, uh, most educational psychology training does not include dyscalculia. Um, I, I'm occasionally dragged in to give one lecture on dyscalculia on ed psych courses. But mostly they, they're not trained in this and they don't know about it or they may have heard about it. There's quite a lot of um, continuing professional development related to dyscalculia. So, for example, the British Dyslexia Association is holding a conference in mm. June, where I'm speaking, uh, about dyscalculia. Um, and, in fact, the BDA now has uh, does recognise dyscalculia, has a committee about it, and also uh, accredits courses to teach you about dyscalculia. And in fact, there's... Two universities now do teach a course on dyscalculia, Bath Spa and Edge Hill, but it's not widely taught to Ed Sykes. Most teachers don't know about it. Most parents don't know about it. So there's still quite a long way to go in making this better, better recognised. Which for me is quite concerning because if you look at financial literacy and the um, developing demands we have on anything from a mobile phone contract to, you know, as you progress through into being a young person and then an adult, the demands on being able to manage credit cards, home loans, all of those um, different aspects of managing money become significant. And if you can't manage it, uh, you can end up in a lot of trouble. Well, indeed. In fact, there's a bit of work on this. So, for example, Dr. Lynn Weber, Deakin, developed a, a test for financial competence, which is actually very useful. And there's a group in uh, Italy uh, led by Carlo Semenza, which has also developed a special uh, financial competence test, which uh, I think is being used in order to assess whether uh, an individual is competent to manage his or her own financial affairs. And that there is research saying that you know people with very poor math skills are not so good at, for example, judging which is the best mortgage for them and which is the best financial instrument for them to use. So, yeah, it, it's bad. And the other thing is that we know that low numeracy, uh, there's a, um, a government report um, from 2008 uh, which shows that the effects of having dyscalculia on your educational chances, your long-term income uh, and your health is worse for dyscalculics than it is for dyslexics. So dyslexics is less of a challenge for uh, employment than dyscalculia. Uh, so that's quite an interesting and little-known fact. Mm. Uh, yeah. That's really interesting because I know as um, a dyslexic with very poor math skills, I have struggled all my life to be able to, until probably now, and I've just turned 40, uh, to be able to manage uh, my finances in a way um, to make sure that I can pay my bills on time. And it's not even that I don't want to, but there's, there's like these blockers. And so for me, I have to have everything direct debited out of my bank account. I've had to have support and how to manage everything, even racking up a whole heap of parking and speeding fines that I couldn't manage. So for me, it's it's been a real challenge and having the dyslexic added to that or being dyslexic and having the low and poor mathematics skills, it's been really hard. And in my day job, I have to manage big budgets. So I've got to be really careful and have everything triple checked because it's, 
it's not a par as where it should be for a manager. There's um, a friend of mine called Paul, Paul Moorcroft, who's a very distinguished uh, writer, uh, journalist, been a university professor in his time as well, um, wrote a book about his own dyscalculia called It Doesn't Add Up. And what he says is that he's achieved many things in his life, but he still doesn't make very much money, even, even in his own business, because he can't do the sums quickly enough at board meetings. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's a real handicap. Yeah, it, it really is. Um, so I can only imagine how hard it would be for people that have this calculia, knowing how low my math skills are at times. Um, so in my research, looking at what you've been doing over the years, apart from publishing multiple books, you also did some work in Australia, is that right? Or you've got a connection with one of our universities? Yes, that's correct. I, I work um, uh, with Melbourne University in the Psychology Sciences uh, department. And actually, I've been coming since 1985 um, to, to Australia. So I've been working with uh, Professor Robert Reeve um, and his colleagues. And we've actually published quite a lot of work, some of it on just tip, uh, on typical and atypical mathematical development. We published several papers on this really, I would say really important work, including the longest longitudinal study uh, so far, well, certainly uh, some of it's been published, some of it is still to be published. Um, so from kids in kindergarten to kids of 11 years old, so that's five, six years. So nobody's published uh, anything as long as that. We've also done some work on the mathematical abilities of Aboriginal kids. Yeah. And this is very interesting for the following reason which is that kids who are monolingual in an Australian language have a vocabulary that doesn't include counting words. So um, the question is, if you're not exposed to a, a numerate culture, what kind of number concepts do you have? So from a theoretical point of view, being able to test monolingual Aboriginal kids um, is uh, really important. Mm. And we tested two groups. Um, uh, one uh, were the Walbury, who live um, um, in the central desert, about 400 kilometres from Alice Springs. And the others were, were the Anandiliagua, who live on an island off the coast of Arnhem Land, Groot Island. And uh, their languages uh, don't have counting words. So in, in um, Walbury, for example, there's a word for one, a word for two, a word for few, and a word for many. Um, there isn't a word for number. And uh, so the question is, what kind of concepts do these kids have? And it's, it's rather similar with the Anandiliagua as well. What we found was that if you test them in the right way, they have the same numerical concepts as kids in Melbourne who are brought up monolingual in English. Um, so we think that there's... Uh, an innate component to, if you like, the starter kit for learning arithmetic. How well you learn arithmetic, of course, is going to depend on the culture. So uh, kid, kids in, uh, in the Northern Territory, um, insofar as they get an education, which may not be in their own language, by mm. the way, you know, gonna have, uh, they're going to they're gonna have trouble. Also, they don't, as far as I can tell, attend school that regularly because they've got other perhaps better things to do with their time <laughs> um, anyway theoretically i think this was a really really important study and it was published in you know very um, high impact uh, journal so um so that's another thing that, that we've, we've done in in australia and so has there been um when looking at australia versus the uk differences in their understanding and awareness of dyscalculia? Do you find that uh, we're quite far behind other countries or do you think we're on par with our knowledge and our ability to assess and intervene, putting interventions? I can't really talk for um, uh, Australia in general. Robert, Robert Reeve and his colleagues um, have set up a dyscalculia clinic um, at Melbourne University and they go out to schools and explain to schools, you know, 
uh, what dyscalculia is and how to assess for it and, and, do, and do some assessments both in Melbourne and in other parts of Victoria. Speld also is, is, seems to be aware of dyscalculia. So mm. I, I, I did a kind of lecture tour to Speld, um, going you know, right out to Perth and uh, Adelaide as well as Melbourne, uh, talking about it. So Speld is aware of it. Um, I, I don't know how well embedded it is into their practice, but in some places, I mean, particularly in Perth and Melbourne, they, they certainly seem to be well. And, and actually Adelaide too, seems to be well embedded in their practice to the extent that it gets to schools generally. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, the spells do great work within the school system and um, for young people. And it's interesting to see how we can uh, better support young people moving into the, either the workplace or higher education and then adults. Has your work been predominantly with children when it comes to developmental um, dyscalculia? Or have you done any work in, with young people in the adult space? And are there any strategies you could suggest for how we could help support them? We haven't done a lot of work with adults. Um, I mean, we have examples like Paul Moorcraft and uh, some other very high-functioning adults um, because we're interested to see how well you can succeed if you're, um, you know, if you're dyscalculic, but you're good at other things. And you know, we, there's some well-known actors who are dyscalculic, and there's even a science journalist who's dyscalculic. So it's possible to succeed, but obviously it's it's, it's very hard work. Um, so most of our work has been with children. And one of the things that we've been developing uh, recently, which we haven't tried out in Australia yet, is we've been developing some digital games specifically designed for uh, dyscalculic learners, uh, particularly in first and second year of school. They might be useful also for uh, older dyscalculics, but we haven't tested that. So we have a game called Number Beads that we've been trialling in London, in Italy and in Singapore. And it, it seems to work um, for dyscalculic kids. And in fact, it seems to work for all kids. Uh, so they, they get uh, better at their understanding of basic number concepts and a bit more fluent in their calculation. So we think this is one way forward. And we're now trying to develop some games which tackle the problems that teachers tell us kids find really difficult and dyscalculic kids find exceptionally difficult, which is fractions. Fractions are really hard. I don't know. Do you have trouble with fractions? Yes, I think from probably year seven onwards, my maths was just down the drain. And I remember in year nine, the maths teacher said to me, or it might have been year 10, just sit at the back of the class and don't worry. We'll just get you through because it, fractions were really, really hard. And I only know how to do 10% because I like to shop and there's normally a 10% discount. So I'm able to work that out pretty quickly. So you have workarounds of what's really important. You'll try and manage. Or I call my younger brother who's 26 and he'll um, do the calculation for me and give me the answer. So, um, yeah. But for, from probably year seven, which would be about the age of 12, yeah. it started to get really hard. So I think, I think today the final version of our fractions game is, is now available. Uh, not available to you, I'm afraid. No, I can't try it. <laughs> well, you can try it. Um, <laughs> but we don't let things out into, well, into the wild, if you will, <laughs> until we're sure that, they, that, um, that they're really useful. So we have got this fractions game. And we haven't really done, we've done a, 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 a tiny prototype trial, which seems to show it works for some things. Um, but we're now going to do quite a big trial in Singapore. And then if, if that works, we'll let it out into the wild. And so anybody can use it. The other thing that um, teachers tell us really difficult for kids is, is, is place value. And um, so how can you best teach kids place value, particularly if they have trouble understanding basic number concepts. So when you say place value, are you meaning, can you elaborate a little bit more on what that means? 
Yeah, so if you've got um, 13, the number 13, 1, 3, the 1 doesn't mean 1, it means 1, 10 uh, in 13. So you have to know that the place it's in, uh, uh, yep. so, so 13 is different from 31. Because one means one in thirty-one, but it means one ten in thirteen. So this is actually quite hard to understand, particularly since it doesn't correspond to the language. So you don't have place value in the language. Um, you have you have a different way of expressing um, the, the units, tens, and hundreds. So kids have to make a translation, if you like, from the words that they perhaps already know to the symbols that they see. So um, this is actually quite a difficult problem. And in fact, it's taken human beings possibly 30,000 years to go from being able to talk about numbers um, and maybe notate them in ones on bones and stones to having uh, you know, our familiar mm. place back digits. Uh, so it's not surprising kids find it hard. So we're trying to find a way of helping kids understand place value, um, but we've no idea how to do it yet. So suggestions welcome. <laughs> well, if anyone's listening to this podcast and one day know what place value is, which I did, so thank you for explaining. I probably should know. Uh, but if you've got any tips or suggestions, they can let us know. So with the Aboriginal communities you've worked with, um, a lot of my work in the last eight years has been in Aboriginal communities, uh, predominantly in Victoria or within uh, Victoria. Do you foresee that they're, because they don't have a number system like us, that then that impacts then how they manage money and how they're able to develop the financial literacy skills needed for uh, a Western or a, the lifestyle that they come into? Well, we have, I personally haven't investigated that, so I'm, I'm reluctant to talk about things I don't know about. One would think that anybody who has a problem understanding you know, the symbols for numbers is going to have trouble understanding uh, finance, uh, whether having a 30% discount is better or worse than having a <laughs> two-for-one offer. Um, so... Uh, so uh, I, think the, the, <laughs> I, I, I think I think the, the, these are, are issues that I'm going to leave to, to somebody else to investigate. But um, my guess is that to the extent that anybody is or isn't integrated into the numerate society, they're going to have difficulty with finance. So is there anything that we could be doing to better support children and young people transitioning into adulthood around uh, dyscalculia or apart from awareness raising? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that there are ways in which you can actually help dyscalculics become more numerically competent, perhaps using our games. But just knowing what your problem is, is a big help. Uh, I don't know what it was like for you, but an awful lot of adult dyscalculics um, I've talked to say that they were really relieved when they realized that they had this very specific deficit and they weren't just stupid. And I think that knowing this is, is, is generally helpful. Now, I know that there's a whole other school of thought which says that labeling kids is a bad idea. But the dyscalculics I've talked to say labelling them as dyscalculic has been really helpful. I mean, I actually got a, a, an email from somebody, an actual letter from somebody who had heard me on the radio who was 80 years old saying, finally, I understand what my problem was. <laughs> but we, uh, we find that, that very often, that people who really struggle with um, calculation need to know that they have a specific difficulty, rather like colour blindness, if you like, and they're not just stupid. So you're not stupid if you can't tell whether the light is red or green. You are just have this very specific deficit. Yeah, it's, um, we have the same discussions around labelling children here, and I think as an adult that was diagnosed at 27, it, it would have helped me as a child to have known. So then, you know, any intervention that was available back in the 80s would have been helpful for me. So I think, you know, there's a certain um, 
necessity, I think, in identifying children so they can have interventions and supports in place from a young age so that we don't end up as adults really struggling and not understanding and being frustrated and angry at ourselves, I think. Well, thank you so much for your time this evening. It's been fascinating. I've learned a lot. I guess my one question before we finish up, well, two, um, is there any ways within Australia that we could be helping to raise awareness that you think has worked well anywhere in other countries that you've worked in? That's my first question. And then the second one is, would you like to add anything else to our interview tonight? Interesting you should use the word add. Um, <laughs> so, um, no pun intended. <laughs> Actually, that's one of the problems is that the language of mathematics is uh, it can be difficult for kids because adding something to our discussion is not quite the same as adding one to three. And you can talk about, um, um, just in the case of addition, you can talk about what's three plus one, three, add one, add one to three, and lots of different ways of talking about it. And kids have to realize that they all refer to the same uh, numerical operations, even worse when you get to subtraction um, <laughs> and multiplication. Uh, so many different ways of talking about the same idea. I, I think the really important thing is that uh, there's official recognition. This would kickstart the whole, the whole business. So, as I understand it, and you correct me if I'm wrong, this is a, a matter for the states rather than for the federal government. So, a state can recognise dyscalculia. One hopes that Victoria, where I work sometimes, <laughs> recognise it. Um, you know, the, their Department of Education will recognise it. And that would be a start. If, it's, if it can be done at countrywide, even better. But certainly the, the experience of places uh, where it is officially recognised, where there is a law, like uh, the United States and Italy, it does mean that more kids get tested, more kids get helped. And that means that fewer kids end up suffering, perhaps in the way that you did, uh, from not being able to uh, do things that everybody else in their class could do. Yeah, and that's interesting. It'll be something that we go and look back into now around what actually under our legislation is covered under learning disability. Yeah, it'll be interesting to go back and, and check that now, whether it's just the, it's classified as dyslexia only and if you've got any other co-occurring or single whether you're actually yeah, supported you need, and covered. Yeah, you need to t test for everything separately. Thank you so much for your time, Brian. It's been wonderful talking to you. You're welcome. And for our listeners, we will have all your books for them to see if they um, would like to have a look at them. And uh, it'd be great to speak to you again in another time. So thank you so much. Okay. To find out more about Brian and his leading work in dyscalculia, head to the Dear Dyslexic Foundation. If you haven't already done so yet, make sure you sign up to our mailing list so you can keep up to date with everything we do at the foundation. Head to deardyslexic.com. And don't forget, if there is anything you have heard today that was distressing, please call Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36 or Lifeline on 13 11 14. Did you know we now have a new live Q&A series called Question Dis? DYS, created during COVID to help our community feel more connected. Each month I interview a fellow dyslexic about all things dyslexia and life. The Question Dis series is running through Facebook Live. I really hope you can come along and join us for one of these sessions. If there is a topic you would like discussed on the show, please email us admin at dyslexic.com. Thanks for joining us. Bye for now.